Hello, everyone. Welcome to session three of LTech 676. Quiet. Like last week, I want to start out by discussing our most recent critical reflection assignment, Me Write Pretty Someday. In general, I felt you did a nice job contemplating the positive and negative outcomes of adopting a technology such as Grammarly. Of course, this assignment isn't really about Grammarly per se. It's about technological products and services in general and how they can and do change the way we think, the way we behave, and the things that we value as individuals and as a society. Sometimes this is by design and sometimes it's by accident. And of course, Grammarly is a relevant and highly visible example for us to analyze. But we could easily replace this service with any number of other examples. So overall, great work. I also want to thank and compliment this week's discussion thread synthesizers, Sandy and Mark. They did a nice job of looking across your posts and synthesizing the big ideas across all of them. I've posted their work in a shared Google Doc so that everyone in the class can benefit from their hard work and analysis. Reviewing these syntheses is a great way to solidify some of the takeaways from this week's assignment. Now, before we get into the main content for this week, I want to give you a heads up about the next assignment. The next assignment is going to be a concept map assignment. This means everyone will need to create a free account at bubble.us and then use this online software to create a mind map or a concept map. These maps should strive to capture the big ideas included in the material we've covered so far in this class. The purpose is to solidify, organize, and connect the main ideas of LTEC 676 in your own visual, spatial, and textual map of the content. There's no right or wrong way to do this, but in general, your concept maps will be graded along four dimensions. One, content, concepts, and terminology. Two, hierarchical structure. Three, linkages among concepts. And four, visual design and layout. Now, here are some examples of the concept maps created by past students. And as you can see, they're quite elaborate and beautiful informational representations. That's all I'm going to say for now about this assignment. For more information, be sure to check out the details in Canvas, as well as the concept map grading rubric that's linked to the assignment. All right, let's move on. In this video, we're going to continue talking about theme one, the nature of educational technology. Now, it occurred to me that we've been talking about the nature of technology, but I actually hadn't ever defined it for you. Well, as it turns out, a concise definition of the nature of technology is hard to find. So what I decided to do was take a definition of the nature of science and convert it to a definition of the nature of technology. Now, this is from a 1998 article about the role and character of the nature of science and science education. Now, here it is up here on the screen, and I've highlighted all of the references to the word science and scientists and scientific. I won't read this to you, but what I want to show you is over here on the right is that I have replaced the word science with the word technology. So let me go ahead and read this. The nature of technology is a fertile hybrid arena which blends aspects of various social studies of technology, including the history, sociology, and philosophy of technology, combined with research from the cognitive sciences such as psychology into a rich description of what technology is, how it works, how technologists operate as a social group, and how society itself both directs and reacts to technological endeavors. The phrase nature of technology is used to describe the intersection of issues addressed by the philosophy, history, sociology, and psychology of technology as they apply to and potentially impact technology teaching and learning. So that, my friends, is the nature of technology in a nutshell. 
let's take a look at the nature of technology concepts. And I hope that you can see how these concepts give us a richer perspective of technology, what it is, how it works, how people developing and designing technology operate as a social group, and how society itself both directs and reacts to technological endeavors. Now I want to take you back to the 2009 Brian Author book, The Nature of Technology. And something we haven't touched upon yet are what he calls the core principles of technology and its evolution. And one of those core principles is this idea that all technologies are combinations of elements. Now, he uses the word elements in a very particular way. The elements themselves are the building blocks of technology, and those building blocks are, themselves are actually technology. In other words, he argues that technology creates itself out of itself. And that's his second core principle, is that the elements of technology are themselves technologies. And his third principle is that all technologies use phenomena to some purpose. So what is meant by the term phenomena? Well, this is what Arthur writes. He writes, technology builds out not just from combination of what exists already, but from the constant capturing and harnessing of natural phenomena. At the very start of technological time, we directly picked up and used phenomena. The heat of fire, the sharpness of flaked obsidian, the momentum of stone in motion. All that we have achieved since that time comes from harnessing these and other phenomena and combining the pieces that result. So let's think about these core principles in relation to some educational technologies. Here's an example, the abacus. What elements are combined to make the abacus possible? What phenomena underlie the creation and the function of the abacus? How about chalkboards? What technological elements need to be in place in order for the chalkboard to emerge? How about edu educational games such as the Oregon Trail? What technological elements are combined in order to make that educational game a reality? What phenomena undergirds that particular technology? And what about massively open online courses such as Coursera, where you can actually earn an entire degree completely online? What are MOOCs made up of? What, what are the underlying technologies? And what phenomena have to be in place in order for this technology to emerge? Now, this brings us to analyzing Grammarly, which we did for Critical Reflection 2. How is Grammarly a combination of elements? Well, some of the elements are written language and grammar, natural language processing, point-and-click graphical user interfaces, the internet itself, machine learning. Those are all elements which in and of themselves are technologies that undergird or make Grammarly possible. And of course, I don't need to tell you how the internet or natural language processing are examples of technologies. And what phenomena does Grammarly use to some purpose? Well, we might think about the inherent structure of grammar. After all, grammar is a set of structural rules governing how we create phrases and words in a natural language. Another phenomenon that Grammarly takes advantage of is human pattern detection. Our desire to detect patterns and to use consistency and to write and communicate in a predictable fashion. Another phenomenon might be the human desire to be understood and to communicate. Those are all some of the underlying phenomena that Grammarly uses to some purpose. Of course, we can also think about the concepts related to the nature of technology. And I would ask you, how do these questions and the nature of technology concepts change how we think about Grammarly? My hope is that these questions and the nature of technology concepts give you a, a richer understanding of Grammarly, as opposed to a technological accomplishment that merely provides a useful function. So now let's transition a little bit to Turkle's article, Always On, Always On You, The Tethered Self. Now, she argues, of course, and this is written in 2008, that times have changed. And she talks about a second self in the early years of computers. However, in the early 21st century, she says the language of the second self doesn't go far enough. And she writes that our new intimacy with communications devices compels us to speak of a new state of the self. 
She then goes on to talk about this idea of continual co-presence, that on the one hand, we have the real physical world, and on the other hand, we have the virtual world. And ultimately, those worlds have been slowly combining over time. What we have to do as individuals is to balance those physical and electronic connections. And so I ask you, how does this combined world change our behavior, our thinking, and our values? And of course, that question ties directly to the nature of technology concepts 5, 6, and 10. Turkle also writes about technology-induced pressures. She writes, The self that is shaped by this world of rapid response measures success by calls made, emails answered, and contacts reached. This self is calibrated on the, on the basis of what the technology proposes, by what it makes possible, and by what it makes easy. She goes on to argue that with this technology-induced pressure for speed, we have created a communications culture that has decreased the time available for us to sit and think. And so my question to you is how has technology impacted your privacy, personal space, and quiet time for reflection? A question, of course, directly tied to the nature of technology concept number seven. Turkle also talks about Darwinian buttons, and she argues that computational objects or computers and communication devices have an ability to push certain Darwinian buttons in people that cause people to respond as if they were in a relationship. Again, I'd ask you to step back and reflect on, are there technologies in your life pressing your Darwinian buttons? Turkle also talks about deceitful interchange. She defines that as an artifact's ability to persuade us that they know and care about our existence. And she asks, is that good for us? Or might it be good for us in the feel-good sense but bad for us in our lives as moral beings. She writes, the answers to such questions are not dependent on what computers can do today or what they are likely to be able to do in the future. These questions ask what we will be like, what kind of people we are becoming as we develop increasingly intimate relationships with machines. And finally, Turkle talks about our tethered selves. This argument that our experience of living with technology has freed us in some ways and has yoked us in others. And of course, that is a concept we'll come back around to again and again. This idea that we're newly free in some ways and newly yoked in others. And we'll be applying this concept and seeing it over and over again when we talk about educational technology and social and ethical issues related to educational technology. Okay, everyone, we're out of time for today. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.